My name is Ryan Howard. I'm the Territory Manager with eVault. We've been partners with Core BTS for several years now. We really appreciate the opportunity to come in today, talk to everybody. For those of you that don't know us, eVault provides uh, disk to disk backup and DR solutions to Core's clients. We work hard to provide the most secure solutions in the marketplace, and that's what we're all here for today. Um, the lifeblood of your organization is your data, and you need to secure that data from breaches, natural disasters, go schools and goblins, right? It's Halloween, I tried. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, I believe we have a perfect keynote speaker today to help address your concerns. It's a privilege to introduce Matt to you today. He's a well-respected security expert with over a decade spent in the industry. His resume is very impressive. He has advised organizations of all shapes, si shapes and sizes on a variety of security initiatives, ranging from information security assessments, security policy gap analysis, uh, security managed assessments, risk assessments, penetration testing, web application assessments, and wireless assessments. Today, he's going to take us through his experience in the field dealing with data breaches, more specifically hacks, and share what he's learned and, most importantly, ways to avoid and limit your exposure. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce the managing consultant for Core BTS's information security services practice, Matthew Wilson. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everyone, for attending, folks attending online. Um, that makes me seem far more important than I probably am, but here I am. And in keeping with the, uh, the Halloween theme, I just want to show that we do have some superheroes. I, I was told by our ladies in marketing that other folks will be dressed up today. I don't see anyone else dressed up. So thank you. I'm glad I'm the only fool that decided to put on his Under Armour Superman shirt. So with that uh, kind of fun stuff out of the way, again, thank you for your time. Welcome. Uh, this is our 13th event. I've been with CORE for six years. And uh, it does seem to get better every year. We appreciate everyone coming out. I know it's harder to get out of the office. It's harder to, whether you're in charge or, or tell those in charge that you need to get a break. Uh, but hopefully there's some value in all the content and other breakout sessions that you find. And please just message that out to other folks that you work with or associations. We appreciate the attendance here, as do all our, our vendors and, and partnership sponsors. So a quick agenda of what we're going to touch on today, or what I'll touch on today, is I'll just introduce myself. Uh, the concept of this presentation is, you know, a thousand hacks, right? And are we really going to go through a thousand hacks? Uh, well, maybe. Stay tuned. Um, what lessons don't we seem to be learning in the information security space? But most importantly, you know, what can you take back? What can I give you today? How can I help arm you? to go back to your organization and have a positive impact. That's my real goal here. I, I, as you'll see, I don't think I'm getting into anything that's too revolutionary. Um, I like to use the term, we, we evolve. We don't just have a, we have an evolutionary step, not a revolutionary step. And then there will be some time for some questions and answers. And I do encourage you, I mean, I want to keep this, it is Halloween, I'm taking my kids out tonight, and many of you folks are as well. So let, you know, let's try to have a little bit of fun, uh, have some liveliness here. So a brief introduction to myself. We heard a little bit about I'm based here in the Philadelphia area. Uh, the bulk of our security team is here in Philadelphia. I've been in InfoSec for 10 years. Um, the spiel that people have heard from me a number of times, but it's true. I mean, I'm a career consultant for all that's good and that's bad. I will admit that I did some IT audit work uh, years ago, so please don't uh, throw the spears at me. Uh, you know, some auditors are good folks too and turn into InfoSec folks. And I really have worked with clients in, in really any, any space, and as has our team. So <clears throat> there's a lot of industry buzzwords that we're probably sick of hearing, frankly. You know, advanced persistent threat, and we see about anonymous, and um, you know, cybersecurity in the cloud. Oh, the cloud. Everything's in the cloud. I don't know. Anybody got any more? Any favorite buzz terms that you've heard? BYOD, big data. Anyone heard big data, right? So. So again, I don't want to keep bludgeoning you with more industry buzz. Uh, there is a reason and a rationale for that. It does help move some things forward. But again, I just want to touch on, I'm not getting into these advanced persistent threats because I think we've kind of heard it all. And if you haven't, uh, feel, you know, I can point you to Google 
to, to find out more about advanced persistent threats. They are real, I don't mean to gloss over them, but we're here to talk about breaches. And, and when I kind of put some thought into it, breaches are breakdowns, right? And what can they be breakdowns of? Well, we have people, process, and technologies. And, and what my friend here is experiencing is some kind of a breach, right? So he's the person, uh, or an analogy of a breach. He's the person, clearly he did something wrong, didn't maintain his vehicle. Um, the process, that process of maintenance and how he follows up on that and making sure the fluids are topped off and that kind of thing, well, that, that has something to do with it too. And then the technology, I mean, sometimes those diodes and cathodes and chips, oh, they just, they fail on us, right? So, so breaches can have their roots in many things, but if you really break it down to me, what works for me is thinking of it in terms of people, process, and technology. And that's the theme you'll see recur, and that's what I will bludgeon you with today, is people, process, and technology. So I want to explore some notable, what I found to be interesting hacks. Keep in mind, I'm a nerd, so if you don't find them interesting, I can only apologize, and keep in mind, I'm the guy wearing the Superman shirt today. Um, but really, what can we draw from them, right? I think they can be instructive in some sense, that we don't need to look at what happened to pick your favorite breach and say, wow, okay, I need to take that and make, I need to counter that in my organization. But I think the aggregate can help us learn something. And then by tying it to people, process, and technology, you know, can, can, we, can we get a bit better? So I want to talk a bit about default configurations. That's something that we run into on many assessments that you probably have in your environment. So I have on screen there a little Foscam uh, baby monitor. I have a seven month old. And uh, some folks in Houston, Texas recently learned that when you put a wireless 802.11 baby monitor on your network and it's exposed, wow, it sure does have some default configurations to it and all I need to do is to go out and download the software and they discovered someone talking to their toddler over their webcam. So simple things like changing the default configuration on your baby monitor, did you ever think of that? Anyone? No? But this applies to more than just that. And uh, actually I have a video that can demonstrate. Fear storm to your weekend plan. We need to control the volume no here. So this actually happened to a couple radio stations. This one was in Montana, this particular uh, TV station. And you'll see a theme that... I'm Civil authorities in your area have reported that the bodies of the dead are rising from their graves and attacking the living. Follow the messages on screen that will be updated as information becomes available. Do not attempt to approach or apprehend these bodies as they are considered extremely dangerous. I repeat, Civil authorities in your area have reported that the bodies of the dead are rising from their graves and attacking the living. Follow the messages on screen that will be updated as information becomes available. Do not attempt to approach or apprehend these bodies as they are considered extremely dangerous. This warning applies to all so, so again, anyone scared? Anyone fear the bodies of the dead have rose and rejoined the living, walking dead on Sunday nights? No. So, but that was our emergency alert system. Default configuration, default passwords that I mean, can we even call it a hack? At that point, you're kind of leaving the front door wide open with a big flashing light to say, please, come do something to me, right? But you can say that's government at work, you can say whatever that is that, that fits your, but at the end of the day, there's some IT person, whether they are really an IT person or not might be debatable, but some person is responsible for that, right? And that happens to all of us, so we can pick on you know, should we worry about these weird devices in our environment? And well, well yeah, I mean, we should. Um, it could easily be a UPS, you know, it could be our backup systems, it could be uh, any other kind of variety of system in our environment that we're just not considering as part of something we need to go secure. I mean, we even have things like domain controllers a lot of times, that I, even though anymore there's not like a default configuration, but at least a weak configuration that we run into uh, during some of our testing. So, I mean, this still happens today. This isn't a thing of the past, and that's why I'm trying to tie it to that industry buzz, is that, yes, that stuff is important, but don't lose sight of the, you know, the be cliche, it seems to be going around blocking and tackling type stuff. Uh, but it's not just funny for us to laugh at, ha ha, you know, someone has some default configurations. There's money in this, and this, you know, PBX hacking and, and now video hacking that you're gonna hear more about. I've already heard some instances of it. 
I mean, this has been going on for years. Anyone that's heard of the phone freakers from you know, the 80s and Captain Crunch, I mean, that, that was kind of the origination of that stuff in the modern variant is that people will leverage default phone system configurations, get in, make some international calls, and who's on the hook for the bill? You don't feel you should be, and you know, obviously we need to let the lawyers figure that part out, but either way, some damage has been done. So it's not just, you know, ha-ha, there's real stuff. And, and again, just to continue my zombie theme here, uh, just to highlight that, yes, even our road signs can be breached. And again, this is in various parts of the country, but you know, this, this teaches us about a lesson about physical security as well. I mean, you put these things out there, do you really, even if you had them hardened, which I doubt. Um, but here, I wanna stress that hardening is a process, right? That's a breakdown in process. When we're deploying new systems, are we, are we validating that we've done, the ne taken the necessary steps to harden them? Call it hardening, we have a hardening process. Call it your validation process. I don't care what you call it, just make sure you do it. Run a vulnerability scan on your systems. There's plenty of free open source tools out there to do so. Sure, hire Core to come do that. That's what we do, we're pretty good at it. But there's things that you can do to feel empowered and to reduce some of this risk. But something that you probably run into if you're responsible for IT is malware. And the modern variant that I've actually had five clients, uh, honest to goodness, in the last two weeks mention ransomware. Specifically, someone downloaded something and it encrypted all their files and, well, we don't know the key. Um, so that's some real good security that these attackers have. So, you know, there's some interesting things out there, Reviton, CryptoLocker, you might have direct experience. But what I found particularly interesting is that it's direct income. Think about it before, the attacker had to get you to run malware and then they owned your systems and then they went and did something with those systems to make money, right? It was like, do this, question mark, question mark, profit, right? Um, but now they can directly extract money from you and they're targeting businesses now. It's not just home users. I think probably a year or two ago, I heard some sense about this. I'm sure it's even older than that. But now more and more businesses are being targeted. And here's an example, ABC 3340 in Birmingham, Birmingham Alabama, uh, had someone, and this obviously you can't read the screen, I like to say this is like the modern variant of the Microsoft blue screen of death, right? It's the red screen of death. Um, but this was October 3rd, they got hit and it took out some systems at the TV station. And you know, what do you do? Sure, go to your backups, do, do, okay, but you know, do you wanna be doing that for every single case and every single user? And what kind of productivity do you lose? What kind of productivity do your users lose? And then we bring it to architecture, right? So the design, we find that that matters. So let's, let's look at the handicap sign, a handicap entrance way that we put right over a road grate. That's gonna be really convenient for someone in a wheelchair. Or you, know, you can put your door handle uh, on backwards and then opening and shutting the door becomes some fun. Um, but what I wanna highlight here is that the architecture, the networks that we build, a lot of times, what are they? We inherit them. We have different people come and go over the years. And different hands do different things, and we're not necessarily aware of, I don't care if you've even been there for two, three, five, ten years, you probably have some part of your network, if you are responsible for it, that you didn't necessarily have a hand in, that you might not quite understand why it's set up that way. Um, and even when you have an opportunity to do a greenfield implementation of something, a lot of times it's a, it's a part, right? We might have an opportunity to do a phone system or a video system or to upgrade our gear, but that's a, that's a subset of all the stuff that we have. So these architectural flaws, um, they introduce weakness as well. So attackers can take advantage of this. And for those of you that aren't Again, nerds like myself, this is Andrew Weave uh, Arnheimer who gained some notoriety for a variety of things, but he actually did the 2010 AT&T hack, if you remember that, where the, all kinds of information was exposed. But again, this is where I question, was it even a hack? Uh, he simply queried a website that AT&T had stood up and AT&T had linked the iPad integrated circuit card identification number of every iPad that's unique to each iPad had linked it to the iPad user's email address. So it's a number, and numbers are very scriptable, so he went and just created a script that just 
query to get the email address. And that was considered a hack, and he's actually serving jail time for that. Now, should he have done it? Sure, probably not. But if you're going to put yourself out there, uh, you're asking for, for potential situations like that to arise. We had one of our own customers that, that I would argue is an architectural breakdown. There's a couple breakdowns, but large service provider had a client-facing portal application. Uh, I'm sorry, externally-facing clients used it. Their internal folks used it. And we did a test just this year on the web application itself. And long story short, their ERP system actually was had some available. Once you were in the portal, there were some user roles that unnecessarily had access to their back-end ERP system. And our team, actually Nick Dolusky was in the back, conducted the test, found a flaw in the back-end ERP system. Well, in the application, was able to query the back-end ERP system, pull password hashes, and then reverse engineered the, the ERP's password hashing algorithm and cracked some passwords. So again, many breakdowns there, but the key one was why do we even have that built into the application in 2013? That was functionality that might have been necessary in 2005 and 2008 when the, when the system first came online. But look at ourselves, do we still need, is that design today still relevant to the business goals we're trying to hit? But possibly my second favorite one, or second most popular one I think we run into is missing patches, right? Again, this is the blocking and tackling stuff. Sony, if anyone remembers the PlayStation Network hack from uh, about two years ago. Uh, they're still paying for that. They just got fined $400,000 by the, the EU, European uh, Union, for, for their breach. Uh, but overall, it's cost them over $200 million. So yeah, we're not Sony, and you're not going to get hit with a $200 million fine or that kind of breach, potentially. But the PlayStation Network hack, again, many control breakdowns here, but it was rooted in an unpatched, publicly-facing Apache web server without a firewall in front of it. I mean, this is 101 level stuff from 2002, 2000. Um, this is very basic things that large organizations are falling down on. So when you struggle with patch management, believe me, we understand that. A lot of folks do, um, including Sony. MIT, their logo's up there because recently no sensitive information was exposed. But uh, WordPress, which has been, if you've had any WordPress installations, maybe even on a personal blog, WordPress and many kind of shared software like that, Cold Fusion, if they have a vulnerability in that software, it can be exploited on your site. And that's what happened to MIT. Someone was running a web server, some internal information got exposed, nothing particularly uh, damaging, but still, MIT in the news. You'd think pretty bright people up there. I have a degree from Drexel, not MIT. Uh, so, so the lesson I take away from that is staying up to date, right? And that's a process. And yeah, we can use some technologies to help us out, help us execute that process, but stay up to date with your operating systems, your network devices. We treat, tend to treat routers, switches, firewalls like these black boxes that we put them out there, and then, oh, they'll just run forever on their own. Sure, they will, until they're down. You know, and a lot of times, especially with network gear, you're not applying patches because you're afraid of downtime. Well, what about downtime you don't get to choose, right? A lot of the exploits, you can't say against network gear that it exposed data, but it might be a denial of service, and what if you're border firewall or core switch was offline and you didn't choose to make it so. Uh, that's a potentially damaging thing for your organization. Again, you can quantify that. But applications, those supporting frameworks, we've all heard Adobe, Java, sure, but make sure that's in your stack. Take this as your list of your stack of things that you need to account for. And, and remember, don't forget those UPSs. Don't forget those HVAC systems. I mean, for those of you that might run SCADA networks or building automation control systems, those are all in play, and the attackers, you know, they, they're getting more advanced, and the tools are getting more automated, so you're not even seeing very, very talented folks pulling off these hacks anymore. It's just happening because the tool set exists, and they're just clicking buttons. But security awareness, again, something else that we, we see even the White House can't get right here. And folks might remember from 2009, uh, the Salahi couple managed to wiggle their way into a dinner meeting at the White House. You'd think there would be some kind of awareness training at the White House about checking guest lists and these are the kinds of things that people might do, and I'm sure they have it. But even in that kind of environment, we can have a breakdown, right? So people here can be both our strength and our weakness. And we see attackers targeting our people through things like social engineering. So they might physically try to show up to your White House and make their way in. 
but more likely they're going to do something interesting like send a phishing email in or make a phone call in. Phone calls still happen today um, on a fairly regular basis, but not quite as much as the millions of email messages we seem to get that hit our environments, right? And that happened to the White House even this year. Uh, the military office based out of the White House had a spear phishing attack against them, and they have actually haven't admitted to what data walked out. I can't imagine what the military office of the White House would have. But they had their own small breach that they had to report on. Right? So even the White House has issues with communication and awareness. So our response to that is to focus on our people. Right? Awareness involves our people and we need to have a process to make sure we're doing it. And you need to incentivize people. So if you're not conducting awareness trainings today, make sure you do it. You know, make sure you're touching base with your users. Make sure at least once a year, especially new users. Um, again, I realize this isn't something that's very revolutionary, but we ask, we talk about this when we do assessments. We talk about this. I'm talking about it with you today because clearly it's still a problem. Uh, but I don't want to pretend that in doing awareness training you're going to solve the problem because we've had plenty of clients that have really good awareness programs and continue to have users clicking links. Well, we're going to have that. Hence, you layer your controls, right? So you, you make sure you're doing the minimum of a due diligence with educating your folks and incentivizing them. Give them a stake. If you're a financial institution, you got it easy. Most folks that work at a financial institution bank at that financial institution. So you can give them a direct stake in your data security by saying, this is your data too. Uh, if you're not at a financial institution, remind them that you probably had to fill out an employee form that has social security number and that kind of stuff. And, and I use the term gravity. The gravity of the data we deal with is often lost on us until we're reminded of it through some kind of a breach or some kind of weakness that we identify. Um, make it fun, as fun as it can be, as fun as I can make this kind of thing. Make sure, you know, Give them a $5 Starbucks gift card for locking their computer screen. You know, give them, if they have passwords on there, you know, a couple folks have passwords written on sticky notes under the keyboard, the cliche. Well, those that don't, give them the $5 Starbucks gift card. And that way you're positively nudging folks in the right direction and incentivizing good behaviors instead of just reprimanding poor behaviors. But then we run into third parties. So now we've done all this work. We've in, we have an awareness program. We're patching our systems. We're doing all this really great stuff. But what happens? We have to leverage third parties. So global payments, for those that aren't aware, is a huge credit card processor. It's who everyone, well, not everyone, a lot of folks use on the back end. They had a breach. Uh, and the trickle-down effect was global payments name got drugged through the muck in the sense of the industry. But most folks. You know, my wife had no idea who Global Payments was. My wife is a brilliant, wonderful woman. She's a teacher. But she had no idea, nor should she. She doesn't need to know who they are, but who does she know? If, if our bank or credit union was compromised and you had to deliver that message to your client, it doesn't matter if Global Payments got compromised. You could explain it away, and that might give some folks some ease. But what can we do better, right? So even these third parties, they're really becoming the mechanism to target us. Right? We're leveraging. You're seeing that with Anonymous. You're seeing that, you know, even to bring up the, the RSA hack from a couple years ago, these targets aren't really the targets. We're going through this third party to make our way to the real target. So we have to look at our other controls, our third party management controls. You know, what are we doing there? If we have designed strong controls, if we have good process, then we should be considering that already. So again, the brand name isn't going to be the one, uh, or is going to be the one that gets drugged through the muck, and that might be your name. So that's not a scare you, you know, create some fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That's a real issue that you see. And the Bank of America issue, same situation, where uh, Bank of America actually had uh, a third-party vendor tech systems get breached and exposed all kinds of internal information. That actually was tied to Anonymous. Anonymous did that. But, you, I mean, who's tech systems to anyone? But everyone remembers Bank of America got hit. So what lessons don't we seem to be learning? Um, well, we, what I've seen and what I think my team has seen is, is there's been, there has been some incremental improvements. You know, we can kind of thank Microsoft Tuesdays for uh, having a patch management process for a lot of organizations that forced our hand, and that's actually a great thing. We are seeing some folks uh, hardening systems a bit better. There's some awareness, but again, some inconsistency there. And, and we see everyone has antivirus, right? That's kind of the first question any auditor worth his or her salt would ask you, do you have antivirus? Sure. And where do you have it? What is it doing for you? And now it's 
gaining all kinds of functionality, endpoint protection, it's an IDS, IPS, all these wonderful things that it's doing for us. Uh, so we're seeing incremental improvements, but still we're missing the fundamentals. And we're also seeing, and what we can learn and take away is we see Sony, we see MIT, we see Bank of America. What we can really learn from that is the size, big, small, and budget doesn't necessarily mean an organization is secure. I think there's a lot of assumptions that when people heard, you know, Sony got hacked, there was a lot of assumptions there that said, well, wait, Sony got hacked and it was missing patches? And to me, it was, of course they did. Of course they got hacked and of course it was missing patches. Because they're just like us. They're no different. Yeah, they have a bigger budget, but bigger budget, bigger problems sometimes. More silos, difficult to navigate that kind of environment. So, again, think about in your environment what that can, what we can learn and what we can take away. And I think the other thing I draw from this is that widgets aren't necessarily security. Uh, there's a lot of widgets, a lot of really good widgets. We need those widgets. The widgets enable us. The widgets give us our information. But don't put a widget into your environment. And again, pick your widget. Pick your IDS, IPS. Pick your SIM. Pick your whatever it is, uh, anti-malware, endpoint protection, BYOD, MDM device. They're all important, but don't put that into your environment and assume that it's just going to take care of things. We need to validate that. But we also need to realize that there's some things that that solution, that widget, is not doing for us. Be honest with yourself about what it's not doing. Uh, and probably most importantly is dedicate appropriate staff to it. How many times, I can't tell you how many times I've seen someone go spend $100,000, $200,000 on some solution, and then there's no one listening on the other end, no one watching the logs, no one getting the alerts, or if they're getting the alerts, it's going to some group box that they're not checking at all. So yeah, you can tick an audit box and say, yes, we have a SIM solution in place. Yes, we're doing file integrity monitoring. But, but you're not. You, know, you can tick that box, but is it effective in your organization? And how many dollars did we waste? So make sure you're staffing it appropriately. We all get asked to do more with less. Wear multiple hats. Trim down that budget. But be honest. If that's going to be the case for you, find a way to solve that business problem within the context of your budget. And be honest about what you can accomplish. Don't try to just go get a solution so you can make someone happy temporarily and maybe waste budget that you could have dedicated elsewhere and better utilized. But I think we also can look at just knowing our data as something that really isn't happening. Do we know where it is, what it is, how much of it it is? I mean, Sony, do you think they set out to say, no, we have all these credit cards and um, we know where they're at. We're just going to leave them behind an unpatched Apache web server with no firewall. Like, that wasn't a plan. That was, it's, and you could say it's incompetence, sure, at some level, but it's not, they're just, they, they didn't understand the gravity of that data and it didn't, clearly did not understand exactly where it was and what it meant to their environment. Sure, someone had to have known, but they definitely did not appreciate that data. And, and it's even required by some compliance regulations. So if you process or store credit cards, you know, you're subject to PCI. If you're a healthcare organization or work with a healthcare organization, you probably have ePHI. It's explicitly required. The language is very, very clear. You need to know where your data is and define it. So if you don't know where your data is, get some sense of it. Start asking questions. Start talking to people and prodding them. A lot of times when we do assessments, you know, we can just spend an hour even with a, an organization talking through, tell us about your data. Let's see where the systems we think it is. Help us understand that. And that can help make us better and help us give you better feedback and hopefully spark some interesting questions that you can go ask some other folks. We did an assessment recently where we heard someone wasn't taking credit cards. Well, maybe, I think accounting does it, they only process like one a month. And then you go and talk, it actually wasn't as bad, but it turns out they're doing probably 30 a month. So there, it was a scale thing. Now, 30 isn't necessarily huge, but it's still way more than they thought they were having in their, that thought they had in their environment. So giving something back, I hope, hope you folks, uh, and again, we can make some of the content available, but you know, we've covered some other organizations and how they got hacked. So again, what are some of the specific things we can say, do better tomorrow, things that you can actually do? These aren't things that require a whole lot of dollars. They certainly require your effort, but that's going to be, you know, the cliche. If, if everyone did it, it would be easier. If it was easy, everyone would do it. So how can we make an impact? Identify a champion in your organization. It might be you, but someone needs to own it. Senior management sets the tone for every organization. If your senior management doesn't take it seriously, and again, you might be subject to that senior management or you might be a senior manager, if you don't take it seriously, your organization won't. You know, we have some clients that just, they say from the top down, it's just, it's not a priority for us because we do X. Fair enough, I can't, I'm not gonna debate the CEO 
of a company that says, I don't see a big priority in this. I can certainly tell, talk to the risk of that kind of mentality, but I'm not gonna convince him or her to change their mind overnight. I just have to plant that seed and hope that they understand that there's, you know, there is some seriousness here that they do need to, to approach it a bit differently. So senior management really needs to set the tone. So if you're in that position, I encourage you to just be aware, and hopefully today I made you aware, of some of the things that are going on and potential situations in other organizations that could impact your own. Um, if you have to work through senior management to get your budgets, well, you know, I can't tell you there's the one way to win with them, but maybe you can help educate them. Maybe we can help work and be your advocate. Assign responsibility. When everyone owns security, no one owns it. And I consistently, time and time again, I go into an organization and talk about like ownership and roles and who has this responsibility and well, you know, this person I think has that and that person I think has that, well, then no one really has it, right? So we need to formally define that. Who owns it? It could be you. You might have to own it because no one else wants to step up. But again, that's the question of does it make sense for your organization? If that's the right thing to do, we definitely need to assign that responsibility. We need to dedicate staff. Again, I talked about it before. We're asked to wear multiple hats, but if you're asked to wear too many hats, if you're currently wearing too many hats, we need to find a way to message that to senior management that hopefully uh, does understand the value that we bring as an IT organization and then can say, okay, I understand that you know Jim has a bit too much on his plate. We do need to add some staff. And I, again, I know that's hard, but we need to dedicate that staff. If we don't have it, we just need to message back to the business about, well, this is how far we can take it with what we have today. This is what I can accomplish or what can be accomplished. And it's not admitting defeat, it's being honest with yourself and it's communicating what you feel is the risk. And then again, it's up to senior management to make that decision. Small improvements, each step, just keep chugging, just try to fight the good fight. I mean, we can, making small improvements and focusing, don't try to focus on the big slam dunk uh, we know that's they're few and far between. It's hard to come by. So try to just climb each step. And I know that's you know kind of a rah rah thing, but I think it's very applicable. The organizations we work with that see, I understand, identify, and understand their weaknesses, and then just kind of knock them out. They're the ones who improve their security posture. The ones that try to you know boil the ocean, do too much, pick your favorite cliche. There, the ones that do that are the ones that every single year we find consistently the same issues. Right? We're always going to have missing patches. There's always new vulnerabilities coming out, always new software. So I'm not saying ignore that one. Throw that one out. We're always going to have that. We accept that that is going to be the case. But we can manage the impact of that risk if we have a good process. Right? So we don't have 1,000 patches to go apply. We have 10 or 20, which is a more reasonable number. We need to define the policies and then actually live up to them. I mean, how many people have policies in their environment that, you know, I mean, they could be kindling if we needed to warm ourselves. I mean, that's about the utility that they have in our organization. And that's common. That's a common struggle in any kind of organization of any shape or size, is we have these policies. They were written in 2004. No one's updated them. And we're not sure how applicable they are. And they're 500 pages long, so of course we don't read them. Right? So look at making actionable policy that you can actually live up to. Make sure you message what you need to. and, and Folks that worked with me, the, the term I like to use is there's kind of two types of policies. There's organization-facing policies and then there's user-directed policies. We don't need to give our users some 500-page handbook on IT policies. We know they're not going to read it. We don't need to hand them the book to validate that. What we need to do is give them the information in small chunks that they can process, break it down by asset. If we're giving them a phone, if we're giving them an email uh, account, if we're giving them an, a laptop, message to them about the risk and ask them to do certain tasks, the do's and don'ts of having that asset. And then you can worry about, if you're responsible for IT or information security, you can worry about the logging and monitoring, how often we're gonna check logs and how we're gonna do that and where we put that information, right? Layer your controls, the onion, the InfoSec onion, it's as old as probably InfoSec, but we can't rely on just one control and the organizations that do layer them, that don't just say I have X widget in place and I'm gonna rely on that, they're the ones that are successful. Those are the ones that are reducing the risk. And I'll keep using the term reduce risk because you will never eliminate risk. But layering your controls helps you effectively reduce that risk. Let's fix our defaults, you know, please. Let's make sure that we have that hardening process. Let's keep it up to date. Let's make sure when we're bringing a new system that it gets kind of entered into our collective brain trust at our organization and, and make sure that that's on our radar so that next year we're checking on that one too. 
and apply patches. Again, we can thank Microsoft for Microsoft Tuesday. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. As someone that works with organizations, those that might stress over Microsoft Tuesdays, I look at it from the other side and I say, hey, put everyone on a schedule and said, hey, once a month we can do this, we can tackle it. And you don't have to apply a patch to everything on Tuesday, but the concept of monthly or you know, bi-monthly, quarterly, whatever works for you, uh, the, the term there is risk appetite, right? Judge your organization's risk appetite and then decide well, we can live with a quarter's worth of risk, we can live with a month's worth of risk, and make sure you're including operating systems, devices, third-party applications, and user systems. And it's hard, I know it's hard. There are tools out there that can help make it easier on yourselves, but uh, don't just say it's too hard, I can't do it. There's plenty of organizations that do this all the time, not Sony, obviously. Protect our data. At rest, in transit, we encrypt it by default, and we note our exceptions, right? If we could all just go do that tomorrow, how much better would we be? Uh, again, I know that's a struggle, but that is a concept you can help go push tomorrow. Understand where it is, we understand where it is, we can help better protect it, right? And then if we have encryption applied, many, many states have breach laws and have for some time, well, you know, we might have to actually report a breach, potentially, if we are properly protecting it with encryption, right? So we might not actually have a breach as defined by the government or by the regulation. And make sure you communicate. You know, set expectations for your users. Don't expect that just because they've, you know, we've had Microsoft Office for 15, 20 years that everyone just knows how to act with their IT assets. Set expectations for your users and your environment. This is how we expect you to conduct yourself with our assets. Communicate it to them, test them on it, and then incent them to continue to do it right. Have accountability for your third parties. Right? It's, it's something where we trust but verify our third parties. Core is the third party. Well, we need to treat your data with care just like any of your other third parties need to. So define requirements. Push them out to your third parties. I have large organizations that are clients of ours, good clients of ours with good people that don't have third party security requirements. I mean, it's, it could be one page where you just simply say, hey, this is what we expect when you get our data, how we expect you to take care of it. It's, it's simple in concept. Obviously, not everyone does it, so there's some hangups there. But defining third-party security requirements, pushing it out, and then holding them accountable to it, that's the way to improve your environment. I just love this picture. It's the classic server room fire, everything destroyed, but do we have business continuity disaster recovery, right? And organizations that do, have we considered the totality of what that really means? Are we just worried about replicating data and just worried about replicating, I have a replicated asset over here, I have this SAN, I have this SAN, and then I'm, I'm good? Because guess what, there's probably some sub-processes, business processes that us in IT are not aware of that the business needs to continue to run and we could be missing them. We could be trying to go widget for widget, you know, asset for asset and go, hey, I'm set. But we need to have an actual strategy in place. How are we gonna go do it? What's our recipe book? So don't just focus on the technology. We're probably technical folks, most if not all IT folks in here. Of course that's our nature is to focus on the technology. But if we just do that, we're missing a huge part that could harm the business if there was an event. So quick recap. Controls, again, people, process, technology. They apply to all three. These tools, solutions, widgets, they make our lives better, but there's some caveats with how we have them in our environment and, and some responsibilities we have. And you know, we don't need to talk through 1,000 hacks. I don't know, I think I counted it was somewhere like 15 or 20 or so hacks, so not really a thousand, my apologies for the bait and switch. But we can learn from the mistakes of others. You know, we can learn from those that we communicate with, whether they're peers that are here with you today or other organizations in a similar vertical. You know, understand what's happening to your, kind, your business and other businesses like you, and then that way you can hopefully glean something from that. So with all that being said, um, did I inspire any questions? Does Superman need to come back out? And Yes, sir. Oh, thank you, Dan. Sure. I mean, that's uh, those of you that may or may not have heard of the Verizon Data Breach Incident Repro Report (DBIR) comes out every year, usually early part of the year. Um, I encourage you to at least go get 2013s and check out past years. But it, it indicates just that, and that's probably the most comprehensive 
breach reporting tool there is. I forget the last numbers in terms of total number of breaches, but Vince, you're spot on. I mean, there's, there's plenty of things that don't go reported. Um, that, that data breach incident report is kind of the best summary of what is reported. Um, I often hear from, from even our clients or some from prospective clients that well, we've never had an incident. And I think it's very hard to definitively say that. You very well might not have. But what gives you the confidence to say that, right? Do we know that we have taken care of all these things and we have great monitoring controls and we can say with some degree of confidence? Or is it just a gut feeling like, well, I never had to go take a server down so we haven't had an incident? I don't know if there's a one-to-one -one correlation there. So, so absolutely. I mean, some very many breaches do go unreported. Um, with certain regulations like state data breach laws and HIPAA and PCI, there's more of an obligation for organizations to report. And as a consumer, right, who my healthcare insurance is through, I sure hope that they actually do so, so I get a notification if something happens. But certainly there's no guarantees. I'm sure things are covered up from time to time, but how do you quantify that, right? Very difficult. So thank you. Anything else? Anyone? Any folks online have any fun, cool, interesting questions? Oh, Carlos. So you mentioned uh, people, processes and, processes and technology. Which of the three do you think is uh, the best one to start on so you can get a quick win and kind of begin kind of that improvement of the security program? That's a good one. So. I guess I'd have to go with uh, process. Um, it's probably to me, I, I'll, I'll start there, because when we do kind of our typical security assessment, um, we want to understand what you're doing. How are you doing certain processes? Because that's a bang for the buck situation for you. You can change a process. If you have a, you know, a user provisioning process, just to nerd out on you for a second, right? We have how new users come into our environment, how they're modified, how they're terminated. If there's something wrong in that process, I don't know if you need to go buy a widget to solve that problem. You probably don't. You could probably just change the process, right? It might be something as simple as don't set everyone to the same password, like change me or password or password one if you're trying to meet the Microsoft complexity requirements, right? So that, again, common stuff. I bring it up because we see it all the time. But process is something that, you know, dollar for dollar, I don't know how you beat it. I mean, people are going to be tough. You're going to have to invest a lot of time with your people, which you still should do. But if you're looking for the quick turnaround, uh, invest in your process, look at your process, you know, have, have an assessment done, obviously, I would say. Anyone else? Bueller, anyone? No? Well, thank you very much for your time today. I very much appreciate it. Have a good day, and uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>